Welcome, Journeyers. I'm Tony Carnes, your host for A Journey Through NYC Religions Television. New York City produces terrific journalists, great journalists. The best of them have a rich variety of rich experiences here in New York City. One such journalist is Charlie Wiley. He grew up on the West Side playing in street gangs and then became a vaudeville actor, starred in two Broadway plays, or was in two Broadway plays uh, that won Pulitzer Prizes, and it was uh, in another uh, play also, and then went to World War II as a, to entertain the troops, joined the troops, became part of the Navy in the Pacific Theater, came out of the war, became a journalist, covered 11 wars or more, and visited 100 countries. And along the way, he met quite a few and interviewed quite a few religious, significant religious actors. Charlie, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. You know, it is, I can't say how excited we are to have you on the show because you have such a wealth of experience and have talked to so many people that I hardly even know how to begin. But I do know that one significant religious leader in New York City that you interviewed and followed from the very beginning was Malcolm X. Can you tell us a little bit how Malcolm X came on your radar? And then how did you make your first contact with him? Uh... He was on my radar because I used to read the uh, Amsterdam news regularly, and he uh, suddenly appeared on there. There were articles about him, and then he wrote a, a column. And so I, I got to, to know quite a bit about him, and I was fascinated by him because of some of the stories uh, about his incredible leadership and, and, and the loyalty of, of, of people to him. And I wanted to meet him and interview him, and I had a friend who was a, a, a black journalist. Uh, and I said, you know, I wanna, I would, I'd love to interview uh, Malcolm X. And he laughed. He said, he's not about to talk to you because that was <laughs> when he was in his, you know, hate the white man period when he was with the black Muslims. And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to give it a try. You know, can you give me any lead how I can get to him? And he said, well, if you'll swear on a stack of Bibles, if you'll never tell anybody in the whole world where you got it, I'll give you his home phone number. And so I called him. I was in Queens at the time. And uh, I was in my, in my living room at home, my wife on the other side of the room. And I called, and he answered the phone. And um, I said, uh, Minister Malcolm, he said, yes. And I said, well, hi, I'm Charlie Wiley, and I, I, I'd sure like to get an interview. And he said, oh. And after that, I kept talking, and he kept not answering. But there'd be a word or two, always very polite, uh, no problems, but, but never was really answering any questions. He did, would, he, did he, he act wary say, when he... Answer, did he act wary when he answered the phone or he just said oh, hello? Well, he, he was, you know, just he answered the phone and I was there and, he, you know, I did my bit. And, and this went on for about five minutes with my asking questions and saying, well, and finally I said, well, I, I guess we can't get together. And he said, no, I guess we can't. And I said, well, you know, maybe you could answer some questions for me and and, uh, and there was silence and then I'd answer a question and there'd be a one word answer, which was really no answer. So finally, after about, I don't know, five minutes of this, I said, well, it looks like we're not gonna get very far with this. And he said, I guess we're not. And then I said, and remember up to this point, you know, just as nice, quiet, you know, calm. And I said, well, and I said, you know, I'm just trying to do my job. And he said, I'm sure you are, which was his way of saying he thought I was with the FBI and, and, uh, or some police department. And then I said, well, you know, uh, you know, goodbye. 
Now, I can't really do a job of what happened next. Now, remember, this was a calm voice, very, very uh, nice to me. And uh, I said, well, goodbye. And then there was a pause. And then the voice came on and said, goodbye, Mr. Lucifer. I'm telling you, uh, my wife was on the other side of the room and she looked over at me and, you know, I put the phone and she said, what's the matter? What's the matter with you? And I said, what, what, what do you mean? She said, you're white as a sheet. And I looked down and I had goosebumps <laughs> on both arms completely covering me. I have never heard hatred in a voice in my life like that. Well, what, after that, what did you think? I mean, how did it change I your thought understanding that he didn't like of... white people very much. <laughs> 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 no, it, that, I have never heard a voice that, that did to you what that voice did. Remember, I was in Queens. He didn't know me. He didn't know where I was. He was 20 miles away in Harlem. There he was in Harlem. You were in what part of Queens, Queens at that time? Uh, what's that? You were in what part of Queens at that time? Uh, Flushing. And, Flushing. And, and, and this was about what year? You know, you, you're talking about a lot of years ago. 63, maybe? 63. I, I don't know. It's, when he was still with the black Muslims. That's right. He was still with the black Muslims. So I guess that was 63. I guess, what did he get killed in 64? He he got killed in uh, uh, 64, 65. Yeah. Well, this would have been when he was still with the black Muslims. So what happened was that after that, I tracked him. I, I followed everything he did. And not only in, in the Amsterdam news, but I, I made it a point when... Finally, he became well known. When I first was trying to reach him, no, no, no white journalist even knew who he was. I arranged to have him interviewed by uh, Mike Wallace, uh, and I think that was the first interview he had. And after that, I kept close track of him and and so on. And then, uh, you know, he had the the run in uh, with with the uh, black Muslims and and left them. And at that point, a friend of mine who was the editor of the U.S. News in New York called me up one day and he said, hey, Charlie, your man Malcolm X is having a press conference across the street in an hour. So I rushed in and I went to the press conference and I waited till everybody was finished. This is when he had first left the black Muslims and now was on his own. Where did he hold the press conference? And he held a press conference to talk about his new, his new world that he was in and, and that he was going to be visiting uh, the Middle East, I guess, and whatever. Okay. And uh, I, went, I went to the press conference and I waited until everybody had asked their questions. And even after the questioning period and it broke up, there were always a few people that asked an extra question or so. And I waited for everybody else to leave. And then I walked over to him and I said, hi. I said, my name's Charles Wiley. You probably won't remember, but you and I had a talk a couple of years ago. And uh, I then started to talk about some of the things he had done. And he was quite impressed by my knowledge of his background. What did and you, do you remember what you actually, talked about? Huh? Do you remember? I just talked about whatever I had seen Right. And at that point, he gave me his phone number. He gave it to me. And he was living in, in uh, uh, I guess, Corona or near Corona in Queens. And he gave me his phone number. And after that, we had, uh, uh, I met with him. And then we had a lot of phone conversations. And that was when the phones were attached to the wall by a little wire. <laughs> and 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 uh, and I used to tuck it in under my chin while I did dishes and stuff, and talk to him about everything in the entire world. I mean, you name it, we would talk about it. Do you, and, can you? And, and so I probably knew more about Malcolm X and what he really thought about things because we talked about everything. And if you look at my, uh, I did I did a uh, an obituary of, about him. Mm -hmm. For the uh, uh, for National Review, 
that's the only place you're going to get a true picture of Malcolm X because yeah, everybody that. on all sides was, was kind of pushing uh, their own point of view and trying to use him for whatever it was. And, you know, I just talked to him about whatever. So I, if you want to know a lot about Malcolm X, go get that article and you'll know more than you will from all the books written about him. Yes, I, I read the article and it was a terrific article, long and uh, uh, sets him in context. Uh, did you uh, sense uh, when you talked to him, so you started talking to him after he made his break in uh, 64. Uh, you started talking in 64 the, by phone. Yeah, I, and yeah, you uh, asking? Did he ask you advice or what did he want to talk about? I don't, I never quite understood. We just talked. I mean, yeah. we, we would talk about the news of the day in, in you know, the important news that, that had some, you know, more than just passing interest of people. And and we just talked. We talked about the future and and and, the, and, and what he thought about the various public figures that were around at the time. And of course, he, 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 he talked, uh, uh, about the black Muslims, and he, he he was obviously at that point very unfavorable. <laughs> and he said about them. I mean, my final meeting with him was was fascinating. Uh, I was uh, I, I was on the phone, and 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 at that point in the game, he was on a thirty day death sentence from the black Muslims. The the word was out in the black community that he'd be dead in thirty days, and and. Uh, I wanted to meet with him one more time, and I figured they'd probably get him. And and uh, so I we set up a meeting. And my wife, who never cared about the people I dealt with, I knew kings and presidents, and it didn't none of it impressed her. She she just went on about her business. But when it came to Malcolm X, when she overheard that I was going to meet him, she insisted that she go with me. And I said, no, you're not going with me. They, they may try to kill him while I'm with him. And, no, I'm go and we had a big argument, actually. And she won. And she went with me. And we met with, with him at uh, 2 o'clock and, and after the lunchtime and before the, the evening crowd when the place would be empty. So <laughs> we got there and we had an absolutely empty diner. And... Uh, we could sit any place we want. So we took the farthest uh, to the back booth and we both sat down on the side with our backs to the wall and looking out. And so he, he came walking in after a couple minutes after two, he left his bodyguards outside and he came in alone. Now remember, here's an empty restaurant. You can sit any place you want. Mm -hmm. And he came over and instead of sitting across from us, he sat down with us. So there we were, the three of us sitting three across, each one with, <laughs> obviously with our back to the wall. <laughs> what were you thinking? Uh, what, uh, will they get me by the shooting at him? <laughs> well, as it turned out, they didn't actually get him on the 30 days. They, they, I don't uh -oh. think they got him for another month or two after that. Right. But of course, it, eventually they got him. They, you know, he, he's such an iconic figure. Um, you were impressed with him because of the loyalty and control he had. Uh, but why he's such an iconic figure. I mean, he just rivets into people's consciousness. How do you explain oh, yeah. that? My wife made one of the greatest lines I have ever heard in my life. There was a, a television coverage of his funeral after he died. And Tina was watching it with me and she turned to me at one point and she said, you know, it's like watching a great novel and you have read up to the last chapter and suddenly the only copy is burning in mm -hmm. front of you. So you'll never know what the end was. And that's exactly what it was. I mean, when he died, we have no idea of the influence that that man would have had on history. He would have had so much 
influence on, on black white relations and the civil rights movement and everything that had to do with it. He would have changed history. Now he was a, a peculiar combination of engagement and distance with politics. He, uh, here you are a, a combat, a, a veteran, a combat reporter, and you're coming and talking to him and often about politics. Did he was, in, was he engaged with politics? And, you know, did he, did he vote for candidates or what, what, what was his oh, relationship? No. He, <laughs> all right, I'll give you a piece of information that you won't find any place else. He supported Barry Goldwater for president. Barry Goldwater? Yes. Why? Yes. Okay. His reasoning was the following. He said that the liberals keep lying to his people and promising things that they're never going to deliver. And the most important thing he could think of to do was to get the black population to understand that they had to do it themselves. And he said the best thing that could happen would be for Barry Goldwater to become president because he tells the truth. He tells exactly the way it is. He talks about what he would give and the help he would offer. And, and he also would say how far they weren't going to go. Mm -hmm. And he said that because of that, he was for Barry Goldwater. Incidentally, no, he would never have publicly supported him or any other politician because he did not consider himself an American. He did not right. consider that he had a, a vote in, in, in America because America was, was not his country. Why did he consider himself? He considered himself a, a, an African American in, in that sense, but not in other words, he lived here, he was part of it. Now, that was his original thinking. As time was going on, he was thinking more and more of becoming perhaps part of the American system. And I don't know, he might have eventually got involved in, in, in politics in the sense of party politics and things like that. But you know, certainly, he, certainly he had no interest in that whatsoever. You know, a lot of the woke people today uh, invoke Malcolm X for his distance from America and his belief that America was systematically bad. Do you think that's a, a fair evocation of Malcolm X or are they getting him wrong in some way? No, 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 that, that would be a fair, if you, if you stop, uh, an, when he left the black Muslims. In other words, there was a change in his thinking when he left the black Muslims. He was very, not only anti-American, he was anti-white when he was with the black Muslims. Mm -hmm. But incidentally, he taught, when he was a black Muslim, he, he taught wonderful things uh, to, to, to his adherents. He, he taught self-help. He, he taught that you should be mannerly, that you should absolutely respect your women. That was one of his biggest things. And he believed in dressing well and behaving well. And he believed in starting your own businesses and, and so many things that, that are really valuable. He believed in the family. He believed in all kinds of things that, that perhaps you could say the Christian concepts in, in the United States are, are, are still there today. And so even when he was with the black Muslims, he was teaching a lot of things that were good, but he did not, he saw the United States as a country that had no use for black people and, and had, you know, had, had segregated from them. And he said, well, good, then let's <laughs> segregate. Let's do it ourselves. You know, he used to, um, he, he, he told some people that he saw his appearances uh, somewhat, not falsely, but somewhat as dramatic appearances, that he was presenting himself in a certain way. Uh, 
almost like an actor, though I think he, he, he wasn't acting out anything that he didn't believe, but that he saw that the moments that he appeared in was were dramatic moments. And his appearance was very charismatic. Well, um, he could change. And I think that my first phone conversation yeah. with him shows you how he could change. I mean, for, I don't know, 10 minutes, he was a, cordial. He didn't answer any questions and, and didn't really do much in the way of cooperation, but he was, you know, soft-spoken and, and, and courteous and so on until that last line in which he absolutely changed completely. And he did that too. I mean, he could go on television and, and you know, have a sense of humor and, 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 and he had a great sense of humor, by the way. And, 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 you know, very calm and talk about things, but then he could go out on the street corner and give a fiery speech. I mean, he could shift gears like very few people could. And, now, and he was, that's part of his, uh, you know, charm. He was a Muslim. Did he ever uh, talk to you about his uh, Islamic faith? Not, I, I don't remember him, but I do know you know, the changeover. First of all, the black Muslims had nothing to do with the Muslim religion. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the teachings of Elijah Muhammad <laughs> have nothing to do, you know, really with black, with, with the Muslim religion. Uh, when he broke with them, then he became a devout Muslim. He actually uh, went uh, to Saudi Arabia. And, and, and so he, he was a believer uh, and, and there was a complete change. I mean, being a black Muslim was not really being a Muslim. And he became a Muslim after he left. Uh, and, and how religious, I, I, I don't know. He didn't talk about religion to me. Hmm. I did get the overall feeling. I don't even know how, you know, but maybe a few things he would say from time to time left me with the impression that he was very devout. Now you, uh, he uh, did did not come from New York, but he always uh, feels to like to people that he felt very natural being in New York. He as a New yeah, York. I think so. Well, he, you know, I mean, he could go into Harlem and and obviously felt right at home. He came from Omaha, Nebraska, mm -hmm. and and uh, spent a big part of his life there. Now you yourself. You grew up on the um, upper, uh, Central Park West area. Uh, upper West Side. Yeah, tell us a little bit about how uh, how you grew up, Ben. Was, were your parents uh, religious at all, or that was not part of the household? No, in fact, if my father went into a church, it would probably have, the roof would probably have collapsed on him. Uh, my <laughs> mother was a fallen Roman Catholic. And she was fallen because she had uh, married outside the church and raised me as without raising me as a Catholic. She considered herself a Catholic, and I'd say, "But mom, you're you know you, you you're not a Catholic because you didn't get married and you didn't raise me." And she said, "I'll decide whether I'm a Catholic or not." <laughs> and so she went to church every uh, every Easter and Christmas and called herself a Catholic. Did you, dad, did you go with uh, her ever any time? What's that? Did you ever go with her uh, on those uh, holiday visits? No, ventures? the only time I went to churches was when I had friends that got married uh, later later in life. And then I, I went to a, a youth group at, at a Unitarian church. And of course, youth groups at churches are always for the same purpose, which is to pick up girls. And and has, has very little to do with religion. You didn't find any uh, Unitarian girls that you decided to pick. Yeah, up? I married one of them, <laughs> but she didn't get you into church. <laughs> What's that? But she didn't. Oh, well, get she you wasn't. Into she she wasn't practicing either. In right. other words, you know, most most of the people that go to the uh, youth groups and in, in there they don't preach. In fact, I gave my first public speech. Now, I'm not counting show business because you're reading lines, but I gave my first uh, uh, public speech in uh, All Souls Church because they had a thing where 
one of the members of the youth group, we used to meet on Sunday nights at eight o'clock and at 7.30, they would have uh, one of the members would give a little uh, a lecture, uh, a little sermon. And, and I ducked it for as long as I could. And in those days, I was playing the horses for a living and bumming around the country. And so I, I, I was the last person in the world to give a job like that. And they finally said, you know, you've been here for, for a long time and you've never given a single one. You've got to give one of the sermons. And so it was great because that was the one week that everybody showed up on time. Usually people came in after the sermon. Everybody showed up because they thought that was going to be, you know, a pretty wild talk. And I gave a very serious talk. And, oh, this, and, how old were you then? Oh, by that time, that was after the war. Oh, uh, okay. So, so we're talking, you know, early 20s, I guess, maybe 21. Now, you, you were you part of a... A sort of a kids gang in the upper west. I think I remember you saying that. You well, when you say people. gang, yeah, you, we were a gang in the sense we were called the Warriors, and and we all hung out together on Ninety Fifth and Columbus. But gangs in those days were quite a bit different than gangs today. In other words, we never did anything dishonest, criminal. We never picked on people. We didn't do any of that kind of thing. And, and by the way, any guy in my gang could take three of these punks for breakfast because we were really tough. We did not carry guns or knives because we had absolutely no reason to have them. And, and, and uh, we never picked on people. We didn't have fights with people and beat them up and that kind of thing. We were totally different. Okay, <laughs> Charlie, we're going to have to wind up. We're going to leave you with your warriors. Um, uh, we, there's so much more we could cover, but I did want to cover Malcolm X because, as you know, it's two people that are alleged uh, to have um, assassinated him, uh, they invalidated their conviction. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm glad is... to be with you. I hope <laughs> I hope I helped uh, straighten out some people on some of the things about Malcolm X that are not not very well known. Journeyers, this is Tony Carnes, your host for A Journey Through NYC Religions Television. Thank you for being with us.